The sensational upstart band from Waterford has done it once again. Another sold-out concert has been added to their ever-growing list of sellouts. Another satisfied audience sent home smiling, mostly teenage girls, several of which were escorted out of the stadium after having thrown themselves on stage in an act of undying love and adoration for their favorite rising stars. If there is a list that can be placed on peanut butter and jelly, it doesn't seem to have been found yet. The new band just keeps right on doing what they've been doing all along, playing songs from yesterday to the youngsters of today. The kids just love them for it too. It goes against all rhyme and reason to have such melodies from a bygone era take hold over the youth of an era of iPhones and Facebook, but there you have it. It's happened. Jingles, turn off the news. I was able to hear the original versions of the songs years ago, back on the clogged home world. That was enough for me. I don't need to hear these poorly produced broken mirrors. I don't know what these kids see in these. Ah, forget about it. Kids will be kids. That doesn't mean I have to put up with it. With young Orville gone, I'm done with children once and for all. I'm done with kids, with cheerfulness, with ladybugs, candyland, puppy cakes, and happiness. I could use a nice helping of depression for a while. Wow. All right, Mama Empty. Just for a while, though. I don't want you to wallow in misery for too long. Not with a house filled with sick people. Jason, Ollie, with the way things are going around here, you can never tell who will be next. What is that? It's been going on for a while now. Every time I go to find out what it is, it moves. Like it knows I'm following it. Maybe. Maybe I'm just being paranoid. You know the old saying, Jingles. Just because we're paranoid... Doesn't mean they aren't watching us. True. Still, it could just be the wind. This house is built pretty strong, so it shouldn't be coming in every single room like it does. I've heard it all over the house. There just isn't any reason for this noise to be doing the things it is doing. Jingles, there is something familiar. mystery will have to wait. For someone who doesn't have any friends, Mervyn sure gets a lot of visitors. It's nice to see you, Jack. I missed you when you were over here the other day. You came when I was out seeing the old studio, saying goodbye to it. I was over there earlier today. The new set is finished. Already? Wow. I didn't know that it would be done so quickly. I knew it was to be demolished, but wow, gone already. So many, so many memories gone with... Lazar asked me to give this to you. It's a piece of the old set. <laughs> Shut up, kid. Life does go on. You've got your hands full here, I hear. Yes, indeed I do. That's why I left. Not enough time in the world to handle it all. That's what brings me here. Is she here too? Follow me. Mama MD, a pleasure as always. Jack, it's always nice to see you. Won't you sit down? I don't know that I'll have the time to stay. This isn't a friendly visit. I need to talk to you. It's important. By all means, Jack. What's on your mind? Your son. It would be. What's he done now? Or what did he do? Nothing. Before this, before his sudden departure, he informed me that there had been an overdose within this house. He said it was, and I quote, a civic duty to inform the local authorities of any infraction which had occurred on the premises, unquote. The blockhead! You are fortunate. I answered the phone when he called. What else did he say? He said all was under control. It is, Jack, it is. Naturally, since this area is under my supervision, I came over to check on things. Since Jingles is also a friend of mine, I kept this low key. Due to the nature of what goes on in this house, as well as all who reside under its roof, I felt it best not to inform my superiors of where I am right now. Depending on what I find here, I might not be able to keep the present status quo. As all things with this house go, I try to keep the police and all officials away from it as much as possible. However, if there's been a drug overdose on the premises, well, you know the current state of Waterford, the drug problem. Investigations do have a way of leaving trails. I can't promise others won't be coming by eventually. Understood, Jack. I appreciate your help and your predicament. 
here's the story up to the current time. My son, prior to his leaving, he was experimenting with a cure-all for carbuncles. In the end, it proved to be a successful cure for the illness, or so my son said. Young Ali, who is currently residing here, he found the cure in a petri dish while Orville was letting it cool. Ali then stole the cure and injected it into himself. The carbuncle cure then sent Ali into a coma, which I successfully saved him from. As for the effects of the injection itself, to date, I've been halfway successful. He is out of immediate danger. However, there are still major complications to be resolved. It sounds complicated, Mama Empty. It is, Jack, it is. Why did Ollie induct himself in the first place? Some time back, Ollie fell under the influence of a being called the Overseer. It wasn't hard for this Overseer to trap Ollie into following him. You know of Ollie's issues with flatulence. I do. The Overseer cured him of it. It was a short-lived cure, temporary in nature, heavily dependent on circumstance. Ollie remained cured so long as he did the Overseer's bidding. The Overseer was ultimately thwarted in his attempt at universal domination in another dimension, and Ali was freed from his influence. Once he was freed and returned here, his medical issues returned, so Ali sought his own cure. He left this house in search of it. He hit the streets? He did. As I understand it, he got hooked on street drugs. Oh my. I think I know how the rest of the story goes. He ended up back here then? Yes. Then he saw what my son had come up with. He tried it and ended up in a coma. For goodness sake. It's hard enough on kids as it is. Then you insert interdimensional despots and time-traveling aliens. Um, I don't think I can tell this to my captain. Smart decision, Jack. I do want to make sure that Ollie's okay, though. Mama MT is the best doctor in the universe, Jack. She pulled Ollie through the night. He's doing well, but he's still got a long way to go. He's not going to die from Morville's drug anymore. There's just... Just what? Our blood, Morville's and mine, is not like human blood. It's also what my young son used as a catalyst for his cure. I need to get it out of Ollie if I'm to cure him. However, I don't know how to do that. Yet, I've stabilized him to the point where he's no longer in danger. So long as he remains in this house, he won't regress. The force field? The force field. Can you get the blood out of him, eventually? Eventually, with enough time at my disposal. So long as he doesn't leave this house. He's unconscious now. That protects him from himself. He's not running off in search of street drugs. He's not in a coma anymore, mind you. He's just weak. So I'm staying here isn't much of a problem. As he gets his strength back, however, or should anyone discover us and try to remove him? He's staying here, Mom MT. Don't you worry about that. He'll stay here. I knew we could count on you, Jack. Is it okay if I see Ali for a while? Sure. I don't know if he'll know you are there, but you're welcome to go up and see him all you like. First Jason, then Bunsen, now Ali. So many kids. What's going on around here? Things will get better, Jack. I know they will. I hope so, Jingles. I hope so. You can't tell him, Jingles. You can't tell anyone. I know. I just hate seeing them suffer. That's part of the burden we bear. We've been given a great responsibility, son. A gift of sorts. However, it comes with a price. One that you will pay for the rest of your life. I will say this, though. It doesn't come without reward. I struggle with the price and the reward every day. It's a war that never ends. There's something else on your mind, though, more than just time. There is. It's Ali, Mama. He's been on my thoughts, too. Why, Mama MT? Why? I don't mean why did he do it, I understand that part. The whole thing about the Overseer, wanting to be more, wanting to be more like us. I get that. What I don't get is why, why did he take such a risk, the way he did it with Orville's, with his, with that glop of all things. That was such a stupid thing to do. I don't know what was going through his mind, Jingles. All I can do is guess, if that's good enough for you. One of your guesses is better than my facts. A lot of things were probably going through Ollie's mind when he took Gorville's glop. As you put it, his body has become addicted to drugs. So Ollie was craving those. His first instinct was to satisfy that craving. 
to get a high, if you will. His mind was already partially destroyed as a result of the drugs he had taken. His body was seeing to that, overriding his senses, his thoughts, so that he could get a fix. His sole desire was to satisfy his body's urge for his fix. He'd become what an older generation might refer to as a junkie. His mind was useless. His body was now in control. Ali could have died by taking what he did. That's another part of what he was going through. Maybe life had become so miserable for him that he just didn't care anymore. I can't say for sure, obviously. Maybe the drugs, the physical torment with his illness. Also, of the withdrawal he was going through. Maybe it was all too much for his young mind to take. When he took Orville's experiment, he didn't care what happened to himself. If it helped, great. If not, who cared? Whatever happened, happened. To his young mind, he couldn't lose. How could anyone be so defeatist? Let me show you the answer to that, Jingles. The age of bobby socks and ice cream sodas is gone. These people no longer feel constrained by the social rules of the past. They are better read and more concerned about all people and all cultures. An older generation could learn about fresh thinking from them. Their energy is boundless. They play hard, but they are also involved. They are free thinking for the most part and not afraid to voice their criticisms. But many more of them have simply dropped out. They have made what they consider their own peace with America, and are now involved in finding out who they are. Discovering the inner man cannot be minimized, but a nation in turmoil needs the vigor, the newness of its young. This exploration, this search for new values, has led into a new and dangerous area the use of narcotics and hallucinogens. The brain, the body, indeed the freedom to do, can be so jeopardized by these drugs that new politics, more realistic values, and a meaningful, less materialistic society may never have the opportunity of becoming a reality. The turned on people who seem to set many of today's lifestyles are not the only ones smoking grass, popping bennies, shooting speed, or dropping acid. If they were, the problem would be somewhat less tragic. These practices have spread to colleges, high schools, and even elementary schools. The students are being exposed to drugs that many of them believe are without lasting physiological or mental effects. On the contrary, these substances are extremely dangerous. This trend toward drugs has alarmed every responsible segment of the community, for they know that there are inherent risks in the drug experience. Aside from its illegality, there is a medical risk to the brain and body. Perhaps the biggest risk is the placing of the psyche in peril. At the moment, these students are striving for something. In time, they may become total dropouts from a world that needs desperately what they can offer. To try and cut through the undue propaganda on both sides of the drug problem, Dr. John T. Burroughs, Medical Director of Narcotics Education for the Los Angeles District Attorney's Youth Advisory Council, clarifies the extent of the drug problem and the term addiction. Well, I think the use of the word addiction is definitely obsolete, and it's been a, a, a very unfortunate thing that it has uh, been used to try to define whether a drug is harmful or not. Uh, this use of the word addiction was started with the World Health Organization in 1950, and they have uh, realized their great mistake in this, and have recently, in 1965, completely redefined uh, drug problems in other terms. Uh, we know that the drugs have two effects that cause dependency or the desire for the use of the drug. And uh, the most important one, and the one that was not emphasized in the previous definition, is the psychic dependence. The dependence of the person from a mental point of view upon needing or desiring the drug. Now, there is also, with some drugs, physical dependence. 
One important part of the drug problem is that so many substances are available or are being made available for use. Dr. Burroughs describes some of the major ones and their effects. From the complete anesthetics, or the ones that will put you entirely to sleep, we can go into the depressants, or the downers, as they're known. And these are, of course, primarily the barbiturates. These are known as the uh, red devils, uh, the secondals, uh, the nembutols, or yellow jackets, the uh, two and alls, or rainbows, and so forth. These are all, of course, the barbiturate drugs. They can be taken by mouth, or some people prefer to take them out of the capsule and give themselves the drug intravenously. Now, the barbiturates have some very severe problems with them. For one thing, they do produce tolerance to a certain degree, and it is necessary to take more and more of the drug to produce the same effect. However, this tolerance uh, is limited. Now, under the effects of the drug, there tends to be a distortion of time. And of course, the person is confused. And the person may accidentally take more drug than he had anticipated, forgetting that he had just taken a dose a few minutes before. In addition to this, the barbiturates, when withdrawn, do produce a physical dependence or withdrawal type reaction. And with the barbiturates is a marked tendency for the person to develop convulsions grand mal convulsions or seizures, and unless these are controlled, they can lead to the death of the individual. After the uh, depressants, we come to the next major group of drugs, which is the stimulants. Uh, the first ones to be used were the more mild forms, the dexedrine, hearts, as they were called, peaches, and so on. And dexedrine is a mild form of a stimulant drug used in medicine uh, for appetite control and in certain diseases. In medicine, we might give five to 10 milligrams of dexedrine or benzedrine, or the new drug, uh, methamphetamine, methadrine, which is known uh, among drug users as speed. As incredible as it may sound, the person who's using this drug as a drug user will smack or mainline, that is take intravenously, a thousand milligrams. 100 times the dose that any person would give in the medical use of this kind of drug. And the effect is overwhelming. In this kind of dosage, it causes a fantastic speeding up of the mind uh, function so that the person suddenly feels a rush of tremendous numbers of ideas flashing through his mind, and as a matter of fact, with hallucinogenic type overtones his blood pressure may exceed 300 millimeters of mercury. And as you know, uh, normal blood pressure is perhaps 110 or 120 millimeters. At the same time, his heart is beating at a fantastic rate, maybe in excess of 150 beats a minute, normal being 72 or so. And he may develop uh, arrhythmias of the heart. That is, the beat, instead of being regular, becomes highly irregular. And uh, there have been rare deaths reported from that. As this drug begins to wear off, there's a tremendous psychic reaction and a, an, an overreaction. So the person becomes markedly depressed, severely depressed, which in itself is enough reason for him to want to take more drug or perhaps to take barbiturates to ease this feeling of anxiety and depression or other drugs or back to meth or speed again. This depression is so marked that the person may wish to and does sometimes commit suicide. Dr. Burroughs describes two more categories of drugs, the deliriants and marijuana. Most important entity, marijuana. Now, the deliriants are the, uh, the drugs such as the glue, the, the glue sniffing, uh, which include gasoline, ether, uh, paint thinners, even some deodorants have been used. They, like all the other drugs, produce a mind-changing effect so that the person feels uh, a feeling of euphoria, uh, unusual happiness, a feeling of unreality. These drugs have some severe physical effects. If they are sniffed so that the actual material that is being used, such as airplane glue, uh, can get into the nose or mouth, it causes a real burning of the mucous membrane and can cause rather severe damage. 
and it is becoming overwhelmingly evident that an increasing number of children are showing up with brain damage and what we call chronic brain disease. Now, marijuana is not a separate thing. This again is a drug. Just like LSD is a drug, just like amphetamine is a drug, or just like barbiturate is a drug. There's a specific chemical in marijuana known as tetrahydrocannabinol, or let's call it THC from here on out for short, which is the uh, material, the chemical, that produces the high of marijuana. Dr. Burroughs pointed out that a good deal of the confusion concerning the effects of this drug is due to its very low concentration in American marijuana, or grass. Smoking typical pot usually produces mind-altering or hallucinogenic experiences, though sometimes it has little or no effect on some people. But as the drug becomes more concentrated, it has all of the effects of any of the hallucinogens. In high dosage, it parallels LSD. And already, more purified marijuana, hashish, and the synthesized THC itself are readily available. I think it becomes obvious after having categorized all these drugs, we've now talked about all these different categories, one thing keeps coming up all the time, and that is the drug-dependent, mind-changing or mind-altering effect of all of these drugs. The unfortunate person who gets started in this finds himself getting into an ever-increasing abyss, where he starts out with the idea, I'll have a kick or a high, and that'll do something for him. Well, uh, it's true, these things do have a kick, or obviously people wouldn't try them. But the trouble is, the person then gets involved in this vicious cycle. The kick becomes something that is not as good as he thought it was. He finds by using his drug that he has lost his capability to be responsible, he's lost his ability to be a worthwhile, uh, successful student or successful individual. So he starts to seek ways to help him, and the only way he can seek, since he's using the drug now to avoid the reality of his failures, is to take more drugs. And down and down he spins. And he spins into a situation where he is virtually buried alive in a chemical tomb. This is the problem of drug dependency. One of the most tragic things about all this, as far as teenagers are concerned, is what this does to the teenager. A teenager is a person who has finally grown up to the point that he can begin to struggle with making his own personal decision. And he makes these decisions and finally learns how to do them. And when he has gone through this decision-making process, he suddenly turns from a teenager to a mature adult. One of the things that will stop it cold sooner than anything else is the taking of drugs. Because in taking the drugs, the person is doing exactly the opposite of what he's trying to do as a teenager. He is putting himself into a position where he cannot make decisions, where he is only irresponsible and incapable of doing this, and he is cutting his life off. But there are other reasons not to smoke marijuana or to take dangerous drugs. Possession of them is illegal. It is not, as many seem to believe today, an unenlightened law. Nearly every country in the world, including the United States, is a signatory to an international law banning the use, sale, cultivation, and possession of dangerous drugs that have no useful place in medicine, such as heroin and marijuana. Is the gamble of drug exploration worth this? Is it worth the physical and mental risk as well? today are crowded with young offenders. Tragically, many of them are from good homes. 
They are well educated and have opportunities that are available in no other country in the world. One immature and irresponsible action for whatever motivation can bring serious fines, prison terms, or both. A criminal record is never an asset. It can mean the end of a fine future. The drug question is a subtle one. This is an age of change, an age when society and authority are constantly being challenged. All too often, drugs have played a part in or have been used as a principal means of rebellion against authority. But drugs are not the proper tools with which to confront, to change a society that somehow hasn't fulfilled all its promise. Quite the contrary. Drugs rob one of the energy, the attention, the very ability to see what is. And the ability to work for effective changes of any kind depends on clear and disciplined minds. Those who take drugs to produce new insights or for self-discovery or for a host of other romantic reasons find themselves snared and deluded. Illicit drugs are sold for a price the price of helplessness and suffering for the buyer, for the greed and gain of the seller. Many of today's young people are meeting the challenges before them. They are turning on to a world that needs more involvement, more selflessness. The extreme danger today is that which is created by the closed mind. We must not accept some facts about drugs and ignore others. The drug issue is wide and complicated and cannot be faced only by the police. They need the active cooperation and the involvement of enlightened parents, school, church, and community leaders. But above all, the need is for clear-thinking young people who are the most involved and who have the most to lose. If communication has broken down between the younger and older generations, it must somehow be re-established. At the same time, it will be necessary for the young to communicate common sense, one to the other. Mama, Jingles, get in here, now! What is it, Jack? What? Mervyn! What on earth are you doing with Orville's journal? We better get out of here. He's too weak. We can't move him. Wait, something is happening. Thank you, my little raccoon. But your services are no longer required. <laughs> 